Welcome to LGBTQ 102. This is Deacon Laura Spearin from Orchard United Methodist Church. The 101 class was all about terms and definitions. This course is subtitled Theological Beginnings. I use the word beginnings intentionally, as I don't intend this to be a complete and final word. I want to introduce you to some of the basic theological tenets of an affirming stance like we have here at Orchard. Our agenda is pretty simple. I will give an introduction, explain some definitions, go through five groupings of what are referred to as clobber passages, since they are used to clobber the LGBTQ community, and then we will close with some thoughts on where we end up. Introduction. Why are we here? Back in June, when we had the LGBTQ 101 class for the first time, I asked what people wanted or needed in addition to that class about terms and definitions. The theme running through the responses was, we want a class on a theology. So here we are. I would like to point out that everyone is on a journey to learn more about and to understand the LGBTQ community. Each person's journey is unique, and we are all in different places on that journey. I would ask that we all be respectful of one another, and not only that, but compassionate and loving with each other, too, especially those who are at a different place on their journey than you are. Please know that I am not here to tell you how to believe. I will be presenting a lot of information, but I expect you to consider it for yourself and decide. It might be a bumpy ride. We will be going through some very challenging topics. Some are even a little overwhelming to think about. You may find it meaningful to stop the video and think for a while and continue watching later. Some definitions. The first word we're going to talk about is theology. This is made up of the Greek word theos, which means God, and the suffix ology, which means the study of. Theology is the study of God. Studying something means thinking about it. Theology means thinking about God. We all do that, even atheists. So that makes everyone a theologian. We are going to do some thinking about God in this course, and also some thinking about the Bible. In the Wesleyan tradition, we expect everyone to make up their own minds about issues with God and the Bible. That's why we encourage Bible study and book groups and classes. And that's one of the reasons we listen to sermons each Sunday so we can learn and grow in our faith. Again, I am not here to tell you what to believe. I'm introducing some basic concepts in an affirming stance. Biblical authority. This one is a little harder. One of the main things that divides people on the topics of sexuality and gender identity is this notion of biblical authority. This means, what value do we give the Bible? How much authority do we give it? What is the Bible anyway? Some people would say it is the word of God and that God spoke it into being. Some people believe that every single word in the Bible is true, historically and prescriptively. Some would say that the Bible is a book of rules and if we don't follow them, we will go to hell. When I was in my first class in seminary, I heard for the first time that the Bible is a collection of faith stories, the recollections of many people's experiences with God. Other things I have been taught about the Bible include that it is a whole library, not just one book, and that it includes pretty much every genre of literature you can think of. 
history, wisdom, poetry, fables, parables, genealogy, etc. And that God didn't write the Bible, people did. Does that mean the Bible isn't holy? I believe the Bible is still holy, even if people wrote it, because God still speaks with it and through it. Here are some questions to ponder. What does the Bible mean to you? What have you learned about what the Bible is or is not? Our next term is works righteousness. This is the idea that we will be rewarded by God for what we do. For example, following the rules or following the law. This includes the idea that we have to do enough good things to be able to earn our way into heaven. This concept didn't come out of nowhere. It is all over the Hebrew scriptures, or what is often called the New Old Testament. However, even in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament, we encounter the idea of grace, the unmerited love of God for us. We don't have to do anything to be loved. We just are. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, talked a lot about being saved by grace, not what we have done or have to do to earn God's favor, but simply by receiving the free gift God offers us. I mention this because it seems that some people emphasize following the rules or supposed rules over anything else. Modern Biblical Scholarship I didn't hear this term until I went to seminary, which was almost 20 years ago. Before that, I wrestled with wondering if God wrote the Bible or if people wrote it, and if it was all true and correct, or if it was inconsistent in places, etc. Modern biblical scholarship, I was taught, began in the 1850s, so it may be modern, but it's not new. Modern biblical scholarship considers the historical and cultural context of a given passage and asks the author's original intent. This is a different way to read the Bible than just reading a passage and then applying it to contemporary life. Is this new to you, or is this something you have heard before? The next idea I want to mention is the word deconstruction. You may just think of taking an old barn apart so someone can use the wood to make some furniture, but in the church and in faith, when we say the word deconstruction, it means considering long-held beliefs sifting through them, and maybe changing some of them for yourself. This is a very personal journey and not something anyone else can do for you. When I first went to seminary, I was in my 30s. I had been part of the church for my whole life. But when I went to my first class at seminary, I felt like that don't break the ice game. It was like someone took a little plastic hammer and went tink on the ice cubes of my face, and they all fell to the floor. They were still there, but I had to pick them up and figure out how they fit together again. It was really hard and took some years. That's deconstruction. I encourage you to be brave and to stay open-minded during this course and in the future. God is big enough to handle questions and doubts, and even anger and disappointment. I can assure you that you will get through it, even if it is uncomfortable for a while. Proof texting is what we call it when someone takes one verse or a couple of verses out of the Bible and uses that as the support for a belief or statement. This could be looked at in different ways, yes? What about someone who believes that the Bible is the word of God, literally from God's mouth? 
What about someone who believes that the Bible was written by people within a specific time and culture? Modern biblical scholarship says that it is important to consider the historical and cultural context of any given passage, as well as to consider what the author was intending to communicate. That's what we will be doing in this course. Our last term we're going to define is patriarchy. Patriarchy is a system of society or government where men have power and control and women do not. Who benefits in this arrangement typically? Well, men. And who is considered at a disadvantage? Typically, women. And usually, all people who are non white. The reason this is important for this course is because the prevailing culture in biblical times was patriarchal. Women, children, and slaves were considered property, not people. All of these terms are important to keep in mind as we go through the clobber passages. There are five groupings of scripture verses that are typically used to support the belief that being gay or queer is wrong, sinful, against God, etc. We're going to go over each one by reading the passage or passages. I will then explain how it is understood in a contextual way as opposed to just a literal way. The first passage we're going to go over is Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. If you open up your Bible and look at the first chapter of Genesis, you will see that this is one of the creation stories. It's the one that talks about the six days of creation and then the Sabbath. So each day God creates something different. In verse 27, it says, So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. It sounds like a binary. A binary is something consisting of only two parts. We talked in LGBTQ 101 about the binary being like two little boxes, girls and boys, for example, or women and men. But is male and female really a binary? Susan and Robert Cottrell, in their podcast called Simply Put, The Bible Does Not Condemn Homosexuality, point out that in Gen Genesis chapter 1, when it says two opposite words, like day and night, land and sea, it sounds like only two things. But if we look in nature, it is more than that. This is actually a rhetorical device that uses two parts of the whole to describe the entirety of the whole. So when we say day and night, it doesn't just include those things, but also dawn and dusk. Land and sea aren't the entire whole. Where does the land end exactly? And where does the sea end exactly? There are marshlands and quicksand and the ever-changing tides that move where the land ends and the sea begins. Nature, then, includes spectrums, not just opposites. A spectrum is represented by a line or a bar, not just two little boxes. It includes all the possible gradations between two juxtaposed parts of the whole. It is argued that male-female is the same, that it is a spectrum of humanity, not a binary, that gender is bigger than what we see and what is immediately apparent. Next, in verse 26 in Genesis chapter 1, it says, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. If God created male and female, 
and both are in God's image. That means that God is both male and female. So, the Cottrells suggest, perhaps intersex people are the true image of God, since they represent both female and male genders instead of just one. Maybe that feels shocking, but that leads us to think that maybe there is more to God's image than gender. Maybe being made in God's image means the ability to be in relationship, and not just that, but that we are made to be in community. The next section of scriptures we're going to look at are the ones that refer to the city of Sodom. The city of Sodom, along with its partner city, Gomorrah, are famous because they were destroyed by God because of the wickedness therein. Sodom is so famous, words have been made, like sodomy and sodomite. The first passage we're going to read is from Genesis chapter 19. In order to understand the story, I'm going to start with verse 1, although we will be considering verses 4 and 5. The question I encourage you to think about is, is this passage about homosexuality or is it about inhospitality? This is Genesis chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, Please, my lords, Turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night, and wash your feet. Then you can rise early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the square. But he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. And here's verse 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, so that we may know them. This was from the um, NRSV version of the Bible. And now I'm going to read verse 4 and 5 from a different version, which uses different words. It says, Before they went to bed, the men of the city of Sodom, everyone from the youngest to the oldest, surrounded the house and called to Lot, Where are the men who arrived tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may have sex with them. When we look at the historical and cultural context of that time, Sex was not consensual. People in power subdued the people who did not have power. Sex was a form of dominance. It was a patriarchal society, so who had the power? Men. And men had sex with whoever they wanted. Women, slaves, boys, foreigners, and people conquered in battle as a way to exert dominance. So the idea of the men of Sodom wanting to have sex with the two foreigners would have come from a desire to exert dominance over foreigners in their town. Remember that the verse says all the people of the town, meaning all the men of the town. It doesn't make sense that all the men of the town were gay and wanted to specifically have sex with just these two foreigners, just for fun. And what did Lot say to the men gathered outside his door? I'm going to continue reading now, starting with verse 6. Lot went out of the door to the men, shut the door after him, and said, 
I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you, and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they replied, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came here as an alien, and he would play the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot, and came near the door to break it down. But the men inside reached out their hands, that was the angels, and brought Lot into the house with them, and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the door of the house, both small and great, so that they were unable to find the door. Lot was trying to protect his guests because that is what was expected of him as the host to the point that he was willing to sacrifice his own daughters to do that. That's how powerful and how important hospitality was in that culture. The men of Sodom came after Lot at that point. The angels saved both Lot and his daughters in the story. So again, we ask the question, is this story truly about homosexuality or is it about inhospitality? The next verse is verse seven from the book of Jude. It doesn't have any chapters, just verses because it's so small. The verse says, in the same way, Sodom and Gomorrah and neighboring towns practiced immoral sexual relations and pursued other sexual urges. By undergoing the punishment of eternal fire, they serve as a warning. That's the end of the verse. Again, the immoral sexual urges have to do with the way sex was used to conquer and dominate others. It didn't have anything to do with a consensual same-sex relationship like we see today. The next reference to Sodom we are looking at is in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49. It reads, This is the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were proud, had plenty to eat, and enjoyed peace and prosperity, but she didn't help the poor and the needy. That's the end of the verse. Interestingly, there is no reference in this verse to sexual immorality at all. It is that the people of Sodom had plenty to share, but kept everything for themselves when there were people in need. Sodom was punished for its wickedness, but what exactly was the wickedness? Our next scripture verse we are going to look at is Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. It says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. That's the end of the verse. So to look at this verse, we are first going to look at the verses around it, because pulling just one verse out is considered proof texting. I'm going to begin reading at the beginning of chapter 18 of Leviticus. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not follow their statutes. My ordinances you shall observe, and of my statutes you shall keep, following them. I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and my ordinances. By doing so, one shall live. I am the Lord. None of you shall approach anyone near of kin to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father 
which is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is the nakedness of your father. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter, whether born at home or born abroad. And it goes on to give more uh, rules. Chapter 18 is rules for how God wants um, God's people to behave. Not like the people where they were in Egypt, and not like the people of the place where they are going in Canaan, but they are to act like God's people and follow God's rules. So this chapter is a list of rules. And to whom is it directed? This is a patriarchal society, so it wasn't directed to women who were property. It would have been directed to men. And not just any men, but householders, men with power. The next thing we're going to look at is the word abomination. It means taboo. Just like it is taboo to see your parents naked or your sister naked, like the verses we read, verse 22 is also considered taboo. However, the original translation said, if a man lies with a boy. Remember that sex back then was not consensual. It was all about power and control. But what is taboo? is having sex with a power differential. The householders are being told who they can't have sex with, and they are being told they cannot have sex with boys, because that would be an abuse of power. These rules are outlawing non-consensual sex. This is very different than a covenantal, committed relationship between two equal adults today. The fourth section of scripture we're going to look at is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, and 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. I will begin with the passage from 1 Corinthians. It reads, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, or who worship idols, or commit adultery, or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And now the verses from 1 Timothy. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. The first thing to note about the use of the word homosexuality in these passages is that the word homosexuality didn't even exist until the 1800s. It was invented in 1870 by Carl Westfall a German doctor who took a Greek prefix and put it with a Latin root to make the word. It was published in English for the first time in 1891. It was put into the Bible for the first time in 1946. As the Cottrells say in their podcast, people who take the Bible literally sometimes refer to it as the inerrant word of God, meaning that it never changes. However, in 1946, when a committee of men decided to put a new word into the Bible that had never been there before, 
That seems like a change, doesn't it? The original Greek word was arsenikoitai, which biblical scholars believe was referring to non-consensual sex, men with boys or men with slaves. If we understand it that way, which is believed, uh, at least by some, to be more accurate since the idea of homosexuality as we think of it today had no reference point in ancient times, then the real meaning would be that there should be no rape, no child pornography, no sex trafficking, etc. The last section of scripture we're going to look at is Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 32. It begins, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural, and in the same way also the men, giving up natural intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know God's de decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, yet they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. What is the context here? First, the book of Romans is really a letter that was written to the early church in Rome. Paul sent letters to give encouragement and instruction. Remember that a big problem back then was idol worship and worshiping other gods in immoral ways. If we look earlier in the chapter, before the section we just read, it says, beginning with verse 20, Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So, they are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not honor him as God and give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal being, or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. I'm going to read verse 23 again. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal beings, or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. So the verses that follow, including verses 24 through 32, are all referring to idol worship, temple prostitution, and wild pagan rituals. Next, there is a reference to unnatural sex. What is unnatural sex in the Bible? Anything that is not procreative. Does that make sense? Any sex that was not with the direct intent to make a baby was considered unnatural. The reference, however, is to the temple rituals that involved sex that Paul was admonishing people for. 
I would also like to highlight that the list of vices in Romans chapter 1 in the uh, verses uh, 24 through 32 uh, that we read is a rhetorical device. Paul lists every wicked behavior anyone can imagine. He says, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, etc. The Cottrells in their podcast say it's like a politician's speech when they get a crowd all riled up and on board with something. And then, they say, Paul drops the boom. Paul says, therefore, in the first verse of chapter 2. Any time in the Bible when it says, therefore, you know something important is coming. Chapter 2 says, therefore, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. So, it's important uh, to note that you can't take just those verses, 24 through 32, without understanding what Paul is trying to say. And you can't read chapter 1 without reading chapter 2. So what is Paul's specific message that he says in the beginning of chapter 2? Don't judge. So where do we end up? We've gone over some terms and definitions, and we've gone through the clobber passages. You have hopefully seen, or at least you have been introduced to the idea, that it is important to be careful how we read the Bible. If we proof text and just pull single verses out, we may lose the context entirely and come up with a different meaning than was ever intended by the author. I believe, too, that we have to be careful not to look to the Bible so much in all of its translations and edits, etc., through the centuries, that we turn it into an idol and worship the written word instead of the living God. There are biblical scholars and others who would say that the Bible doesn't say anything definitive about queerness as we know it today. Others will point out that Jesus never said anything about homosexuality, although he did say an awful lot about how we should spend our money and how we should treat our neighbor. I would like to close with a couple of additional scripture passages, and then I will read some quotes from some of the authors I read in preparation for today. First. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. James Olthwis, in his essay entitled when is sex against nature, says, I am suggesting that perhaps Galatians 3.28 sets an eschatological horizon in which we can raise the issue of same-sex relations in the body of Christ. If we are all one in Christ, no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer male or female, May then the freedom to which Christ in Galatians calls us not include a call to a love in which there is no longer straight or gay?
and from Richard B. Hayes, who is quoted by James Olthwis. By discerning the way in biblical history the Spirit led people in their time and age, we can have a sense of the way God asks us to go in our day. This means, to be sure, that we may be led to go beyond the letter of certain biblical injunctions to obey their spirit, working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Above all, Paul provides us with a model of hermeneutical freedom. Indeed, Paul's own example would lead us to expect that the community, under the guidance of the Spirit, will remain open to fresh readings of the same text through which God will continue to speak. And from N. Thomas Wright, again quoted by James Olthwis, In this spirit, in the spirit, the church has done this with the question of slavery, usury, divorce and remarriage, and the place of women. And now we face the question of same-sex relations. Sex is against nature when it is against love and the God of love. The moral norms, troth, justice, integrity, mutuality, choice, non-coercive consent, etc., remain clear and undiluted. Violence of any kind in sexual relations is condemned. Rape, incest, abuse of children, battering of women or children stand judged. The relevance of this call to normativity in our contemporary world plagued with violence and anti-normative behavior needs no argument. We have clear normative guidelines for everyone, regardless of sexual orientation. And finally, James Olthwis cites a quote from Richard B. Hayes, who is describing the three constraints which must guide all who recognize the authority of scripture. His third constraint reads, no reading of scripture can be legitimate then if it fails to shape the readers into a community that embodies the love of God as shown forth in Christ. End quote. The good news of Jesus Christ is the love God has for each one of us. We are called as followers of Jesus Christ to both love God and love our neighbor. I believe we are called to read scripture through this lens of love, as the Cottrells put it, and to live out that love in all that we do. Thank you for watching this course. Our hope is that it has given you some things to think about and pray about. The last slide in this presentation gives the sources I have cited.